Okay, so fundamentals, mini prepping. I explained it a little bit in the past that mini prepping is extra the extraction of DNA from from the cells themselves, and after you extract that, you're going to want to purify it. So that's that's mini prepping in a nutshell. Typically, this is done through kits. We specifically use the IBI scientific kit. It's the kit that's detailed in the lab manual. Um, there's other kits though, just for the sake of keeping stuff standard, we like using this kit. Hello, Anna. Okay, so um, mini preps are predominantly used to keep your inventory of DNA in stock. If you just pull stuff from the kit plates that we have, um, then you're gonna eventually run out of stock. Uh, also, the kit plates themselves don't have a very high concentration of DNA. So you're gonna wanna transform that DNA and then mini prep it in order to get decent amounts of the DNA to use for other things like ligations, restriction digests, et cetera. Um, and the goal here is to have a net product of DNA. So you're gonna spend a little bit of DNA transforming the cells and mini prepping it, and you'll get five times, 10 times the amount of DNA out. So you'll always hopefully have a net product of DNA. Okay, so in, in strictly the MSTI gem, um, mini prepping is one of the most important protocols, protocols that we have, uh, but it's also one of the longest and most complicated protocols that we have. And I said this, but kit plates have very little plasma DNA. I think it's around two to three nanograms per microliter. So it, it's pretty much, you can only use that for transformations. Um, then you have to do mini preps. Um, and also the kit plate DNA uh, is in very low concentration in itself. So uh, there's very, very little water within the, when you implement the water, there's very little water. And so pretty much you have to use mini preps in order to get enough concentration of DNA to use it. Here I have a picture uh, of, of screening. This is a little foreshadowing. Um, so these are your colonies that have been properly transformed. And because they've been properly transformed, they have the uh, antibiotic resistance gene within, within them. So they can survive on this plate. And then the bacteria without the plasmid fail to grow and they die off. And the reason why you do this is so you can select, so you can pick out one of these colonies with a um, inoculation loop. You can pick it up and put it into another uh, inoculation broth. I'll get into that. So uh, this is the iGEM page about DNA kit plate. It's how you pull DNA from the kit plate. I went over this last week, but I wanted to pull a few things from it just to orient yourselves with what we're doing this week. So um, within each well, there are two to three nanograms of DNA, which means uh, it's not enough to do anything but transformations. Uh, you're going to use, once you do the transformations, you're going to use that resulting culture on, on the plate to mini prep the DNA. And then um, after you mini prep it, you're going to check the concentrations, make sure it's, it's higher than two to three nanograms. The goal is to get it to around 100 to 200 nanograms per microliter. And that's, that's usable concentrations for what we did in lab. Okay, so screening. So these, uh, assume that this plate has a bunch of different colonies on it. I think in actuality, they have long growth right now um, where the bacteria has covered up pretty much the entire plate. Um, but the goal is to find one colony, use your inoculation loop, pick up that colony, just rub it against the colony and pick it up. And then you're going to want to have another culture. It's going to be LD broth. You're going to stick that inoculation, whisk it a few times to get the cells within the broth. And this is what we call selectively screening for colonies. So we're only picking the colonies that are on the plate in order to get their DNA. Okay, so inoculation, which is after you pick those colonies, is a, the process of transplanting that colony that you just picked up into the broth culture. And that's called inoculation. So each transplanted, transplanted colony that you pick up has the same DNA. If it had different DNA, you couldn't use it because you, you wouldn't know what you're getting. So you, pick, you make sure when you're picking up the colony, you're only picking up one. You don't want to pick up like two or three. And this is useful for getting a large batch of clone bacteria once you inoculate it, because you're going to be growing the single, the single colony in a really large culture compared to the plate at least. And it's going to create thousands and thousands of copies of these bacterial cells that you can harvest at the end. This is a, a picture of the inoculation within a tube. Sometimes you'll, you'll do inoculations, the broth inoculations within tubes, and sometimes you'll do it in like flasks. Um, tubes, typically when you're going from a plate, you're gonna start with the tube because 
bacteria can only handle so much growth when they're that weak from the from the plates. And then after you grow them within the tube, you're going to move that tube up into a flask, and you'll have even more. Um, so th these are the the general steps for broth inoculation. You'll find, like always, much more in detailed steps within the iGen lab, lab manual. But this is to introduce you to them. So. Uh, first, you're going to want to prepare the containers full of warm 37 degree lysogeny broth or LB broth. We have lysogeny broth within the iGEM fridge, but it's it's cold. So you're going to want to separate that into whatever your, your recipe calls for and heat that up within a still or shaking incubator in order to get it up to 37 degrees Celsius. So when you put in your cells, they don't die immediately. So you want those warm in order to uh, increase that growth factor. Next, uh, you transplant that colony from those plates into that broth culture and make sure to whisk that a few times, but don't have like the stick super in deep into the broth because there might be other bacteria on, on the inoculation rod. So don't touch the sides of the, of the tube, just whisk it a few times and then pull it out. It, it honestly, it takes maybe three whisks. It, it's super quick. Uh, you don't have to really shake it around that much. Afterwards, after it's inoculated, you put the broth cultures in the 37 degree shaking incubator. And this, you put it in the shaking incubator because if it's not in that, it won't, the cells won't get enough oxygen um, in, order to, in order to grow. So by shaking it, you increase the oxygen content of the, of the, of the culture as a whole, and that allows them to grow naturally uh, in, a, in, the, in the same way throughout the entire tube. And you'll, you'll wanna inoculate, or, or rather incubate those for for around 12 hours. I don't recommend going over 24 because that's after like the exponential phase in terms of growth. You're going to start hitting the, the death phase where your cell colonies start dying off because they're running out of nutrient medium. So uh, pretty much just leave it in overnight is what I'm saying. Uh, grow it overnight, come back the following morning and start doing your uh, mini prepping. Okay, so mini prepping is very, very complicated. Uh, I didn't want to give you a death by PowerPoint by throwing everything in the lab manual one by one and going through each of the steps, because it's anywhere between like 15 and 25 steps, uh, this protocol is. Um, and it comes with a lot of different buffers that you have to use and a lot of different solutions and um, mixing stuff together, all of that. Uh, but in general, on a very surface level, uh, conceptual way of viewing mini prepping, you, you start with the cell growth and the harvesting of the broth cultures. So you inoculate the broth cultures and then you harvest it by taking that broth culture and separating a little bit of it into a, into a microcentrifuge tube and then centrifuging that in order to get the bacteria in a pellet. So when it's under that much strain of the centrifuge, all the bacteria is gonna to go to the bottom and it's gonna pellet into a, into a hard cellular pellet. And after that, you can pour off the broth and just have the pellet left. Next, you resuspend that pellet by throwing in a certain solution, I won't go into it, but pretty much what that does is uh, the, the solution you pour into it is of much lower volume than the, than the broth culture. So that's going to increase the concentration of cells that you have within the tube per, per microliter or milliliter of solution that you have in it. Next, you introduce some detergent or a base to that, to that tube. And that, what that does is it breaks down the cell membranes and it, it starts uh, denaturing most of the proteins within the cell in order to only have the DNA left. You want to be pretty quick on this, though, because if you leave it in there for too long, it's going to start denaturing the DNA itself. So follow the IGM protocol. Uh, I don't remember how much time it is, but uh, follow that to a T and uh, make sure to stop, stop the lysis by introducing your acid to neutralize that. Um, so next is neutralization. You introduce the acid that stops the lysis, stops the cells from apoptosis. So would we be using a sperm mix or would we say? Uh, you'll be using, a, I think uh, the the base is NaOH, yeah, so it's pretty strong, strong. Um, so and then, then the acid. A strong acid to yeah. Completely. Yeah. I know this. Yes. <laughs> uh, after you neutralize it, um, and the DNA is floating in a solution filled with uh, filled with denatured proteins, cell lipid, all that sort of stuff, it, it's very impure, and you can't use this. So you have to somehow extract the DNA from this very impure solution and you do this through the binding and washing procedure. Uh, this is pretty much just a tube that has a filter in it. You pour your solution into that tube and it filters out most of the, the stuff that 
that you don't want, and it keeps the stuff that you do want the DNA. Um, and your goal is just to separate the impurities from what you want the DNA. Afterwards, you dry that the filter, and uh, you add an elution buffer to resuspend the DNA that is stuck to the filter. Um, and so now that you have just a solution filled with resuspended DNA and none of the other cellular components because they've been removed to the filtration step. Afterwards, this is not really a, a part of the, the mini project, mini, mini prep project itself, rather uh, just a thing that you do on the side to make sure that you did the procedure correctly. Uh, you're going to want to take your, your new solution filled with the resuspended DNA and go to shrink 128. They have a nano drop there, and the nano drop is used for measuring concentrations of DNA. So you can take one microliter of your solution, load it to the nano drop, and it tells you you have so many nanograms of DNA per microliter of solution. And so that's very useful for determining how much DNA or how much microliters you need to pipe that out for your transformations, because transformations require a certain amount of DNA in order to work properly. Okay, I, I know I'm a bit long-winded, but uh, the best way for you guys to learn this is actually to do the protocol yourself. It's a very, like I said, complicated protocol. I recommend reading the mini prep section of the lab manual. I have the page number at the very end of this presentation. Um, and also watching this four-minute video along with reading it. Um, because if you read each step individually and understand it and then watch what the person's doing, you'll have a much better picture of how to act, perform the protocol itself. Um, and the mini project, one of its main points is to introduce you to protocols like this that are complicated so you can do them in the future. Um, and with the mini project, I'll be helping you with that. So it's not like you're going to go in by yourself and be doing this, the mini prepping by yourself. So next week, I wanted to go over restriction digests, which is what you do after mini prepping or one of the things you can do. Now that you have plenty of DNA to work with, you can start cutting it and start preparing to to ligate or glue the, the DNA together. I also wanted to go into gel electrophoresis, which is one of the steps you do after restriction digest in order to separate your, your digest, the, the gene of interest, and the rest of the, the plasmid that you don't want. And so gels are used predominantly for that.